welcome to Feminist Question Time, um, brought to you by Women's Declaration International, the leading global organisation defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. There's more information on our website, womensdeclaration.com, where you'll find our Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, which has been signed by 33,219 people from 160 countries and is supported by 463 organisations. We have over 100 volunteer activists, including 53 country contacts, Please do join us as a volunteer if you can um, and get involved in this very important work building international sisterhoods and defending women's rights. Today we have a video from Vaishnavi Sunda, which is a teaser uh, for her forthcoming uh, video or film which is called Through the Looking Glass. And then we have a recording made yesterday by Vaishnavi for us introducing the film. Uh, after that, we're going to hear from Maria Benetti from Argentina, Gender Politics for All Genders. And then we're going to hear from Kate Coleman from Keep Kis Prisons Single Sex. After that, we're going to hear from Alejandra Vera from Colombia, who will talk about the situation in Colombia. And then Vicky Lax, who is launching a campaign keeping Primark's sing uh, changing room single sex to work towards that. And then at the end, we have some clips put together, an update from Speakers Corner USA, uh, the Let Women Speak tour, um, that is being uh, sort of run with Kelly J. Keene. Um, and so that would be nice to, to get an update on where that is. It's actually just from the first two meetings, but it's still going to be wonderful. So I'm really pleased now to uh, hand over to uh, the video that Bernadette is going to show the video from Vishnavi Sunda uh, through the Looking Glass teaser. I'm 39. I'm 50 now. I'm 69. I'm 44. I'm 38. I'm 69 years young. I'm 42 now. I've just turned 71. I'm 65. I'm 53 years old now. I'm 55 now. I was 20 when I met my spouse. We were married 36 years at the time of the divorce. He told me about his belief that he was a woman at 32 years. So I'm 45 now. He started this process about four years ago. We separated at that moment, but we're not formally divorced. Also, ich habe ihn kennengelernt, als ich 34 war, und wir haben dann äh, zwei Jahre später geheiratet. Also, wir sind jetzt verheiratet seit mittlerweile fast äh, sechs Jahren. Ich bin noch 20 Jahre alt. In a marriage where your partner started to use drugs or cheated on you, you would find therapists, support groups, and other women who would say, this is not your fault. But on this topic, people are very quick to question whether or not you responded to it correctly. On the left, it's axiomatic that the untold stories will be told. This particular untold story, no one wants to hear. Media should start to report on the patterns of behavior endured by women and also report on male patterns of crime and violence, which continue after transition. You have to realize that your dad has fallen in love with himself and there's no part for you in that where you're not just a prop. Every action he takes still affects my kids, still affects me, still affects our financial situation. I want women to be angry that we're not being listened to and that we're being lied about. I would recommend that trans activists look at their behavior towards the now single mothers and domestic abuse survivors in the trans widow community and ask how gaslighting and insults and death threats and rape threats square with their mandate to be kind 
Why are they not listening to the voices of women? My experience is valid. I know what I know. I've seen what I've seen. And you ought to listen to me. Hello, sisters. Thank you very much, uh, as always, for your support. Uh, and thank you, WDI, for screening the teaser for Behind the Looking Glass, my upcoming film on the lives of women whose husbands, husbands have transitioned. Um, this project has been underway for some time, as some of you probably know. I have been in conversation with uh, trans widows, as they'd like to be called, for about a year now. And I have spoken to more than 30 women. Um, uh, at Philia, I released the teaser in order to get the conversation going and hopefully have interested uh, people contribute financially or in any other way towards the project. So the teaser basically is just a glimpse into, the, uh, into what the main film is going to look like. The main film is substantially longer uh, and I don't know if like this foric, I'm going to release it in parts or if it's just going to be one film. I'm not sure because there is just so much to cover in the film. And as you can imagine, I do most of the stuff by myself, but there, uh, there are departments in this film that uh, have a lot of other female crew members in the project as well. So for example, there's a lot of stop motion animation and uh, 2D animation that I'm going to employ to Talk, to talk about the stories of women who can't be public about their identity because they are still facing constant threats, deaths, rape threats from their um, current or ex-spouse. So they can't be public about their story yet. Uh, some of them I'm having to obscure the voices significantly. So we are talking about a situation where several women who have wanted to be in the film, but are still not out of danger, but still want to contribute to the project because they are so desperate for their story to be heard. In terms of uh, media uh, visibility, there is so little uh, about the trans videos that we know of, that we hear about. So that's the reason why, despite all the dangers, they are um, interested in uh, sharing their story. So I hope uh, you enjoyed, not enjoyed in the sense that, uh, it is a pleasurable watch, but I hope you appreciated the fact that uh, the teaser sort of gives a little bit of a peek into what the main film is going to look like. So if you are interested in uh, getting in touch with me about the project and if you'd like to donate financially, um, uh, the information is available at the end of the teaser. Uh, if there is uh, any other way in which you'd like to contribute, please just get in touch with me at limesodafilms at gmail.com and uh, we can work something out. Thank you once again, WDI, for screening the teaser of the film. So now all there is left to do is uh, I should just go ahead and make the film for you to watch. Uh, hopefully by, by next year, at some point, the film should be ready, but there is just so much work left to do. So um, wish me luck and... Uh, Thank you very much once again for your support. We're now going to hear from Maria Benetti from Argentina. Uh, she, Maria Benetti has a PhD in philosophy. She is a researcher in the area of contemporary and feminist philosophy and is the WDI country contact for Argentina. Her talk is entitled Gender Politics for All Genders. Um, so over to you, Maria, and thank you very much for coming. I will give you some updates from Argentina and Latin America a little bit. Um, Argentina, you know, was a pioneer and leader in a legal change of sex by self-declaration. Uh, over the last 10 years, 12,600 50 people have changed the legal sex, among them many children under the age of six. But Argentina's um, leading role is not reducible to the gender identity law. 
On the contrary, the gender identity law is just the beginning of a, a huge program to erase legal sex and deregulate the sex market. Uh, this program starts with the registration of gender identity in the place of legal sex and ends with the legal sex replaced by the free proliferation of gender identities. In the between of this uh, plan, there is um, also a two-sided process. On the one side, the internal implosion and fragmentation of sex uh, into characteristic expression parts, continuums, spectra, more or more spread. On the other side, the normalization and universalization of gender identity as it is where uh, the deepest and most authentic in words. Uh, in the transition of this huge plan, a key category is that of genders in plural. A plural neutral noun used as an umbrella to include everything. Gender seems to be the plural of gender, and that likeness is uh, used to confuse and to parasitize gender and sex perspective. So in Argentina, um, in 2019, was created a new ministry of genders in, in plural. That includes every, everyone, women, men, sex, gender, gender identity, LGBTQ, etc. Pregnant and non-pregnant people, the Ministry of Genders is devoted to a spread clear agenda in all areas, levels, and platforms of the state. Work, health, culture, justice, education, science, technology, production, environmental issues, etc. To do that, the state invests an, an annual budget of 3.4 of the gross domestic product to implement this um, gender plan. About five times more than uh, the budget of the Ministry of Defense, for example. Sex erasure also demands a radical transformation of language aimed at making sexual difference invisible. I'm going to focus on of this um, control of the language, typical of totalitarian states. The government, uh, along with the Ministry of Genders, are making a great effort to institutional institutionalize the so-called inclusive language. And in order to do that, uh, they created um, uh, what is called the renaming guide. The purpose of this renaming uh, guide is, uh, I quote the, the document, making visible all persons recognizing sexual and gender diversity. So uh, this renaming guide uh, has to uh, learn to everybody how to use this new language. Actually, this renaming guide has been officially adopted by organizations like the Central Bank of Argentina, the Health Ministry, the Secretary for Domestic Trade, the National Social Security Administration, and several, several universities, including uh, the Buenos Aires University in which I, I work. Um, also, the, the ministry and the state also created a program for popular schools in gender and diversity to learn how to speak. Uh, I'm, I'm going to um, draw the attention on three particular cases of this renaming agenda. The first case is the case of care, uh, the idea of a sustainable care. Uh, I guess it is uh, important and deserve full attention this case of care be because care is the new neutral. What genders in plural are to sex or sexual difference, care is to maternity. Queer ideology is going forward under the euphemism of care. The, um, this um, new paradigm talk of society of care and economy of care, also universe, uh, universal and human right to care. To turn care into a universal right is the new goal in order to expand the market of care through the state and private um, corporations. I'm gonna put a concrete example that is being 
taking place now in Buenos Aires. In Buenos Aires, next month, there will be a 15 a regional conference on human organized by the Economic Commission for Latin American and the Caribbean, which is an organ of the United Nations. The topic of this conference is the Society of Care as a Horizon for a Sustainable Recovery with Gender Equality. Uh, we had access uh, to some documents prepared for some NGOs regarding this uh, conference of the um, Economic Commission, and surprisingly, the documents don't mention at all mothers, maternal care, uh, or maternity. Instead, we find the neutral term, genders, person, caregiver, family caregivers, people who care, people who is care, etc. but maternity mothers uh, disappear. Actually, they are also used to criticize maternalism and maternal states. Uh, care is suppo supposed to be a right, but a right for persons and of persons. Uh, the purpose is to professionalize and prioritize care, turning it into a dynamic sector for economic recovery in which a state, private, private sector, unions, etc., multiply the care economy. In this care economy, mothers, maternity disappear, the social function of maternity recognized by CEDO has disappeared, there are no specific policies for mothers uh, as such, no recognition, no, no name of, of mother, no empowerment of women as mothers. So um, the recognition of, for women is to be introduced in the market and the care of the market, designed and supervised by men. But at home, mothers have to work for free. So with a, a group of, of people, Disha, Lara, and Isabella, particularly from uh, Brazil, Nidia, we are preparing a letter to this economic commission to remember them, the CEDO and the social, um, the social function of maternity. Uh, in this vein, also in Argentina, the Ministry of Gender is focused on a bill for an integral care policy system that recognizes and includes all genders. Uh, the bill plans to extend leave for pregnant and non-pregnant personnel, uh, actually 126 days of leave for pregnant personnel and a 19 for non-pregnant personnel. The idea is so to promote policies to democratize and take care within home, in home, without gender-based discrimination. Mothers disappear also here. Uh, that is one case of this renaming agenda. The second case is um, that I want to address is the official forms in which the option of sex has been conflated with gender and redefined as a, I quote, gender assigned at birth. It defines a position that is social, non natural, mar marked by inequality, violence, and violence in relation to the male gender. So, sex became a gender assigned at birth, and we have also two, two kinds of genders the, the gender assigned at birth and the gender not assigned at birth. The most important example of this reformulation uh, in, uh, in official forms has been the form for the national census in Argentina uh, this year. The census form counted three sexes registered at birth and eight genders, identities, not assigned at birth. Uh, remember that in Argentina we have three sexes. Uh, since last year, Argentina recognizes a non-binary or unspecified sex. So in this form, we had three sexes and eight gender identities. Um, these eight gender identities were woman, trans woman, man, trans man, non-binary, other, I prefer not to answer and ignore. But the case is that woman was in both categorization, in sex and in gender identity. Um, with a group of feminists, we filed a legal appeal against this formulation and demanded 
to the state to remove, re remove women from gender identities. The legal action was unresolved before the census, so the census passed and the action uh, kept unresolved and became abstract without purpose because the census passed. So the case was closed. Uh, however, we didn't lose the case. That is important for me. We didn't lose the legal case. The case was closed, just, um, just, just remained abstract, but uh, at least not lost. The third case I want to address in this renaming agenda is the case of the National Meeting of Women in Argentina. This is this National Meeting of Women. It's a real institution in Argentina. This year will be the 35th edition of this National Women's Meeting. But now this meeting is renamed the Plurinational Meeting of Women, Lesbian, Transvestite, Trans, Bisexual, Intersex, and Non-Binary um so in this edition the 35 edition we have two meetings the national meetings of women and suddenly appears the 35 edition of the plurinational meeting of uh, lesbians and trans, trans bisexual etc so just for this year we have two meetings. The plurinational meeting of diversities was in October and the women uh, national encounter a meeting will be in November. The point is that the city government is very interested in promote this plurinational encounter of diversities. So has invested 350 million of pesos, Argentinian pesos, into the plurinational meeting of women, lesbian, transvestite, trans, etc., etc., diversities. Um, and this meeting actually became an NGO, an NGO that raises money from the state and from other donors. Also, the Ministry of Genders paid uh, to some organizations with legal status to participate in this plurinational meeting of diversity. Instead, the women meetings always uh, were self-financed, horizontal and autonomous. But now, uh, opposed to this politics, the plurinational is uh, an NGO financed by the state and other uh, corporations. So we will attend this women meeting in November, but um, the organization of the women meeting is under a huge pressure to reunify both encounters, both meetings, uh, under the umbrella of the diversities. So uh, we are fighting to keep the women encounter because it is a real institution, but uh, we are in the middle of the fight and we don't know if we will be, be able to keep the, um, we hope, yes, we, we can keep the women meeting, which is a real institution in Argentina. So that was a brief uh, update uh, of our context. And thank you so much for, for the chance to be here. So we're now going to go to Kate Coleman from the UK. She's a uh, representative of Keep prisons single sex the first question is uh in a nutshell what's the problem right so what we've just done is a piece of research looking at dbs checks and identity verification and the problem which happens when somebody is able to change gender as part of changing their identity um in a nutshell the problem is, is that... Oh, I'm we sure need saying, to... Well, somebody said already, what are DBS? What are DBS so check? Yes, yeah, sorry. On. Okay, yeah. so I was going to explain DBS checks in the second yeah. point. But I shall explain it now. So 
DBS stands for Disclosure and Barring Service. It's the DBS is a non-departmental public body accountable to Parliament. Um, its functions are provided for in law. And the purpose of the service is to help employers fulfil their safeguarding duties. And again, those safeguarding duties are specified in law by enabling them to make safer recruitment decisions. So the DBS forms part, it's one tool of safeguarding, um, typically for organisations where you will be working with children or with vulnerable adults. But, you know, there, there are other cases where this applies. So, for example, taxi drivers. Um, what it does, it does this by processing and issuing checks on individuals who've applied to work in roles where safeguarding considerations apply. Um, you've got different levels of check. Again, those are provided for in law, um, the circumstances where the different levels of check have to be requested are provided for in law. So none of this is is optional, it's all obligatory. Um, and what the checks do is that they disclose records of relevant past convictions, cautions, reprimands and police warnings. Um, and this, yeah, so that that is it in a nutshell, sort of what the DBS service is. Um, the sources of information that the DBS will check include the police national computer, which is a system which stores and shares criminal records information across the UK. So all criminal records um, from the regional, from local police forces will be transferred to the police national computer. So that's for ease of checking. Um, but at the higher levels of check, you'll have local police force records which are, which are also checked. And that might be for sort of lower level things for arrests, for cautions, reprimands, um, the non-crime hate incidents, which we all know and love, which will be recorded at a local level. Um, those may be disclosed at the higher level of, of DBS checks. Um, and at the highest level, you've got two lists known as the barred lists. You've got a children's barred list and an adult's barred list. And these contain the names and details of all individuals who, for various reasons, there's different ways by which you can get put on one of those lists. But those are people who are barred from working in safeguard in roles where safeguarding applies with children or with adults. So at the very highest level of check, those lists will also be checked against. Um, and I think it's it's important to emphasise that DBS checks, they're a tool of safeguarding. It's not the beginning and the end of safeguarding, that organisations where safeguarding applies, their statutory obligations extend above and beyond just DBS checks. So the problem that we, we wanted to look at what happens if you change your gender as part of changing your identity. Um, there's already been research which, which has been carried out by an organisation called the Safeguarding Alliance, and they looked at what happens when somebody changes their name via deed poll, and they not unreasonably had a particular concern that registered sex offenders are able to change their name by deed poll and thus they can sever their connection with their existing police records, their existing records of offending um, and they can use that loophole in the safeguarding process in order to access vulnerable groups and to further offend. Um, but nobody had looked at what happens when you actually change gender as well. Um, one of our team tried for about a year to get the Safeguarding Alliance to look at this and try to get the Safeguarding Minister to start looking at this and the various MPs who take in an interest in this issue. And we just kept being told, no, no, there's nothing to see, there's nothing to see. Um, you know, government actually agreed to uh, do a review into deed polls and the ability of registered sex offenders to change their name by deed poll. Um, and we asked, will you actually look at things like gender recognition certificates or changing your, your gender by self-ID as part of that? And we were told no. 
Um, so we thought, fine, well, we'll do the piece of research instead if nobody else is going to do it. So the problem, I'm sure this is all going to come as a crashing non-surprise to everybody, um, is that it extends beyond gender recognition certificate. You know, we knew that there was already going to be a problem with gender recognition certificate because you can obtain a new issue birth certificate, which displays your legal gender in lieu of your sex registered at birth and your new name. So we already knew that there was going to be a problem with that. But um, we found that the documents that you can get changed by a process of self-declaration, which include passport and driving license. And you can change these very easily for any reason and without challenge. Um, so these get presented for the purposes of a DBS check. And that means that the individual can successfully sever any connection with existing records of offending that might otherwise show up. So you create a clean slate. Now, there's an advantage to also changing your gender over and above just changing it by deed poll, which stems from the enhanced privacy rights that are granted when somebody changes their gender. And the Disclosure and Barring Service also grants these privacy rights to people who do that. So the upshot of that is, is that applicants who change their gender are able to request that their previous names are withheld from the DBS certificate that's issued. That's if terrific. you change your name by deed poll, you can't request that. If you change your gender as well as changing your name, that's a perfectly reasonable um, and this includes by self-identity. So it's not just where you've got a gender recognition certificate, not that in my view that would make it any better, but just to demonstrate how easy this is. So you can request that all of your previous identities are withheld from your DBS certificate. Now, as I said earlier, um, a DBS check is merely part of safeguarding. It's not the end of safeguarding. And knowing an applicant's previous identities is a key component of safeguarding because that means that the organisation with statutory responsibility for safeguarding can then make their own inquiries about all of these different names. You know, if, if somebody's pitched up and, you know, they want to start coaching kids at football and you've got four extra names there that you didn't know about, um, you know, you can start making some phone calls around other kids' football clubs or, you know, whoever it is to start saying, OK, I know you haven't heard of Bob Ed Edwards, but have you heard of James Edwards? You know, what, what's the story? What's the picture? It's a key component of safeguarding. And of course, you can have your legal gender or not even your legal gender, your acquired gender, your self-declared gender stated on your DBS certificate in lieu of your sex registered at birth. Um, so we were a little bit kind of gobsmacked at that. Um, you know, we, we sort of expected that, you know, and what we did a DBS check for me um, and we were able to get away with, you know, all sorts of stuff, you know, not disclosing previous names. So although there is a tick box on the online application form where you're supposed to, you know, tick that you have previous names and then list those and the dates, there's absolutely, you know, no way to check that it, it all relies on applicant honesty, basically, about doing the right thing. Um, you know, and reasonably you could forget, you know, let's let's be reasonable about it. Somebody could forget, but an omission could be with nefarious intent. It could be in order to exploit a loophole. Um, what we actually found most scary um, was what's called the sensitive applications route. So this is a specific route of application which has been created by the DBS in order that transgender applicants, including those who have changed gender on the basis of self-ID, um, are able to continue to hide their identities. So 
the upside of somebody using this again there's there's no need to use this if you know if if you want to you know exploit the loophole um you can just say oh i haven't got any previous names and you know my name's angela smith you know even though it used to be andrew you know my name's angela smith and i'm female and here's my passport and here's my driving license and here's my utility bill and no i haven't had any other names and there's no way of calling somebody out on that but let's assume that angela actually andrew does want to make sure that all dbs checks are carried out so what andrew will do is phone up the sensitive applications route um and go, yeah, hi, I've just completed this DBS check online. Here is the code, the identification number. Um, I used to be Andrew and I used to be male between these particular dates. And they'll go, thank you very much. They will then conduct the check at whatever level has been requested against Andrew. So at least you know you that the certificate that's produced would display any convictions or cautions or reprimands or whatever it is for Andrew as well as for Angela, but it won't list Andrew's name. It will still just say Angela. And that in itself is a massive safeguarding loop that creates risk. And it will also list Angela as female, not as male. And again, that creates a safeguarding risk. So we asked, is this just for people with a gender recognition certificate? And we were told no. And we were told that the privacy rights Um, for transgender people not to have their previous identities revealed and not to have their sex registered at birth revealed also extends to those who have um, changed gender by a process of self-declaration, which is manifestly not the case. Sorry, you want to say... Can I just... Yeah, I just want to ask. um, So... Let's say if you're a paedophile and you yeah. uh, have found it difficult to get access to kids and you want yeah. to carry on getting it, um, yeah. but you and you you want to not actually have to wear a dress or wear lipstick or anything, can you change to non-binary so you could actually just carry on presenting as a male and get away with all of this? Well, or you, is don't that, have, you don't have, you to, have to change. Pretend to be no, one? You, you, there's no ability at present to change to non-binary your options are binary so if you're a male paedophile you could change everything to female and you can sever your connection with your record of history um it would be bizarre for you to be honest and go through the sensitive applications route because then you'll be flagged when you've given your paedophilia name as it were um so that would be a very bizarre thing to do um but it's so we we also asked let's let's say angela turns up and presents all documents in the name of angela and female and i know that this isn't angela because you know he's six foot four and he's got a beard Um, And it's absolutely obvious. But I want to be inclusive and everything. And for this particular role, it wouldn't matter that, oh, I've decided in my wokery that it won't matter that Andrew is actually, uh, that Angela is actually a bloke who thinks he's a woman. Um, I'm not entitled to know whether... Angela slash Andrew has done the right thing and gone through the sensitive applications route. So I might decide I don't care, but I need to know that all of the checks against all of the names have been carried out. And the only way, because Angela didn't tick the box saying, yes, I've got other identities and these are what they are. The only way to know that that has happened is if this person has used the sensitive applications route, but I'm not entitled to know that because of these enhanced privacy rights that that apply to this category of person. And this, this goes above and beyond anything that's actually in the Gender Recognition Act, where the privacy that the situations where privacy applies are, you know, in my opinion, it's still too much. 
but it is quite tightly constrained. The scope is fixed and it's a relatively narrow scope. And there are exceptions within that where it doesn't apply. Um, but be that as it may, this is one particularly dangerous example, in my view, where the reading of privacy has just expanded above and beyond anything that's actually in legislation. Um, and what about um, you? You've uh, got the, the idea of digital identities. Do you find do you think yeah, they'll be a solution? I mean, we, we keep seeing digital identities are being touted by some of the gender critical groups and some individuals as being, oh, well, this is the solution to this. Um, we had a look at digital identities and they actually, not, not only do they perpetuate the existing loopholes, they actually create additional risk. Um, my sort of philosophical problem with trying to find a way to, to solve this problem through digital identities is that, it's predicated on the premise that it is reasonable that people will want to withhold their sex and they will want to keep that private. And I don't think that that is reasonable. I don't think that we should be accepting that as a legitimate need for privacy and then trying to find ways to enable people to do that. I also think that some of the arguments around you know, digital identities, you know, that one of the one of the beauties of them, it, beauties of them is that you can then selectively reveal different things about you, depending on the context. And I think that this sometimes confuses a situation where information isn't necessary for that particular transaction, and a situation where it is legitimate that somebody wants to keep information private. So, for example, you know, purchasing alcohol in this country where the age to do that is the same across both sexes. So although revealing your sex isn't needed in order to prove your age to buy alcohol, I don't think that means that we should say that it is legitimate to keep that secret. On the other hand, revealing your address is not needed to buy alcohol. And I think it is legitimate that you wouldn't want to divulge that, particularly if you're a young woman in the off license late at night and there's a bloke behind the counter. Why should he then have access to your address? I think you've got issues of safety there. Um, so I, I think we need to be quite careful about that. But no, I mean, we, we looked at digital identities and we created one for me. Um, and the problem with them is that the, the different attributes that are recorded, so your name, your age, your sex, date of birth, et cetera, they're all taken from existing documentation. So where you've already changed your passport or your driving license, or in that you, know, you don't have to show your birth certificate, but if you had a gender recognition certificate, you've already changed your um, birth certificate, where you've already changed those, and those are already, you know, from my point of view, corrupted because they show gender, not sex, and a different name. That information simply gets uploaded into the digital realm. So you're simply replicating the existing problems that you've got at the so-called, you know, if you like, old school paper level. You can use a digital identity for DBS check. You don't have to, but you can. So we looked at the guidance around that. And what's really frightening is that it creates distance between the applicant and the person who's representing the organisation with responsibility for safeguarding. So you can share your digital identity remotely. You don't have to have any face-to-face -face interaction. And verification of that digital identity isn't done by the organization with responsibility for safeguarding. It goes to a third party who verifies it, reports back yes or no to the required level of certainty. So the, you've got a huge gap and that kind of face-to-face -face interaction is also a key component of safeguarding. So let's go back to Angela. Angela pitches up six foot four, beard, you know, booming deep voice and produces a passport which says Angela. I'm going to have alarm bells going off. It also takes quite a bit of, you know, chutzpah 
to be able to go through with that? You know, is there reluctance? Is there hesitancy? Is there anxiety on the part of the applicant when they hand over their identity documents? All of those things, noting them, making a note, questioning, that's all key part of safeguarding. But where it's all remotely shared and you won't even have sight of the documents anyway because it's all going to go through a third party, that opportunity for that face-to-face interaction, which is so key to safeguarding, is just removed. So we've got real concerns about digital identities as a way forward. Wow. I mean, this is absolutely horrifying. It's terrible. It's not great, is it? uh, it, uh, And uh, also, you found out so much that uh, I hadn't heard about. And I guess quite a lot of people, the women here on the webinar haven't heard about. So it's brilliant you found it out. But what are your proposed solutions and what response have you had from government or other safeguarding organisations? So the responses we we had in the the year preceding this report were, you know, as I said, it was like, no, there's nothing to see. There's nothing to see. It's all fine. Um, When I was at Tory conference, there was a lot more interest. Um, Of course, everybody's changed now and it's all shuffled around again. So, you know, we're we're, we're starting to have those conversations again. Um, But I think people are taking it a lot more seriously. Um, But yeah, so our proposed solutions, interestingly, your national insurance number is the one piece of data that doesn't change. That's the one marker that doesn't change. Yes, you can update it. So Angela or Andrew can then have a note put against his national insurance number stating from 2022, I'm now Angela. Um, But the fact that he was Andrew up until 2022 is never erased from that record. So one of our key recommendations is that anything that involves a change of identity, whether it's driving license, passport, whatever, and any any DBS application has national insurance number as a mandatory part of that, because then you have to tie up all the identities. Um, You know, national insurance numbers are given out all the time for all sorts of purposes. So this is not onerous or intrusive in our view. Um, DBS certificates have to have all previous names listed as they do for everybody. There is no special class of person who is exempt from this. Um, And DBS certificates have to have sex registered at birth listed. That again, should be non-negotiable. And if you don't want that, then don't apply for a job where safeguarding is concerned. What can women do now? Uh, And uh, I think you've got a crowdfunder that we could... Well, we've got a crowdfunder, which I'll I'll link to. And I know times are really, really hard, but, you know, even a couple of quid, you know, it really, really helps us out. Um, We hopefully this this should be in one of the, the major national papers next weekend. Um, We keep pushing it off because too many exciting things keep happening in government, which sort of like crowds everything out. So if we can please get a little bit of peace and quiet um, and then we've got an opportunity for that. So as soon as that hits in the press, then we're going to be pushing it out hard to ministers and MPs. So the best way to find out what's going on is to follow us on Twitter Um, We've already got a brilliant network of constituency contacts, but if more women would like to become a constituency contact, that would be absolutely amazing. Um, And just drop me a DM in Twitter. So I think, yeah, just follow us on Twitter for the moment. And then once this hits in the press, then we're going to be pushing it out hard. We're now going to go to uh, Vicky Lax, who is from the UK, and she's going to tell us about a new campaign that she's working on uh, keep single sex changing rooms for Primark which is a big uh, clothing store in the UK but across the world so thank you so much for coming Vicky and over to you. So if we could just pop through to the next slide that would be fantastic and I will just so just in terms of the background Um, In the UK, most clothes retailers, so the likes of Primark, Zara, H&M, 
um, have adopted mixed sex changing rooms. Um, in my experience, and I have worked for a retailer, it's been done fairly surreptitiously. It's been done without consultation um, of female customers or more broadly in terms of the impact of women and our sex based rights and many retailers particularly in in the UK are being given incorrect guidance around our legislation so they either partner with Stonewall or gendered intelligence so what we've ended up with is fundamentally a situation where women and girls in the UK are not able to try clothes on in a space where there are men however they may choose to identify. So just to give just a quick overview on Primark. So Primark are up there, they're fast fashion. Um, it's high volume, it's relatively low cost. Demographic is women and girls, lots of young women um, enjoy shopping there because they can get the latest trends, um, you know, for, for, for pretty good value. Um, what's not to like there? Primark, I suppose, just to, just to give a bit more of a background, is they're branching out in partnership with a fairly leading UK breast cancer charity, which, again, good news um, on one level. They have a range of clothing called Pride, and they do give, I believe, 20% of the profits from that range to Stonewall, albeit they haven't answered my questions around that. Now, again, in terms of where we've ended up with Primark is it kind of came, there was quite a big splash in 2019 when Primark opened two new stores in Hastings and Blue Water. And that was the time when their changing rooms became mixed sex, albeit they call them gender neutral. But actually Primark have been allowing transgender individuals to use whichever changing room they have wanted um, to use since about 2015. So the background to all of this and why are we going, why are we going after Primark is it's been fairly well documented since about 2007 that there have been instances of male sexual violence against women and girls in Primark stores and in Primark changing rooms. Um, so in March 2022, an ex-metropolitan policeman was convicted of voyeurism, having filmed a woman getting changed in the Wandsworth uh, store. Um, he put his phone under the gap at the bottom of, of the changing cubicle that she was using. So he was given a suspended sentence. He's on the sex offenders register for 10 years. He is subject to a... Uh, sexual notification requirement for 10 years, which believe, which includes that he cannot use a, use a mixed sex changing room for a decade. But what was more worrying, I think, with the trend of some of these men is that it then gets found what else they've been doing. This individual had extreme pornography at home. Um, showing, you know, pretty extreme images of, of children and animals so for many of these men the voyeurism that they're doing in or undertaking when they're in primark changing rooms is kind of the tip of the iceberg um so primark i mean one of the other things that happened just to quickly share with you was a security guard who was working for primark he was employed by somebody else he used his knowledge of cctv blind spots to basically sexually assault four 15 year olds in the store and to rape a young girl um, who he had caught shoplifting. So Primark are well aware of the lengths that predatory men go to to access um, women and girls, whether that's in their stores or in their um, changing rooms. I mean, in I think December of last year, our Crown, Prosecu our Crown Prosecution Service issued some statistics that showed that shops, particularly supermarkets, so not necessarily Primark, are responsible for about 36% of voyeurism prosecutions in this country. So it is a serious problem. But Primark basically haven't really done 
anything. I've been into Primark stores in, uh, as it so happens, uh, England and Wales over the last week. I've had a friend in Scotland and very few changes have been made. So this kind of all came to a little bit of a head, for want of a better word, of word in, in September. A young woman um, posted a film on TikTok. She was sitting in her car and she was in tears, having just been harassed by two men in a larger group in the Cambridge mixed sex changing room. Now, this young woman is might not feel that I speak for her. I'm not claiming to because she loves inclusivity, um, which I think is what we're teaching our young women to, to budge up. But she basically said, you know, if you go into a changing room, try not to go alone. I won't ever be doing that again and stay safe. And I think for me, I just I'd had enough by then. I've I've asked very nicely um, retailers that I've worked with if we could talk about single sex spaces. And all you ever get is silenced and told that you're being hateful. So what Primark then have said they were doing is they provide a dedicated woman only changing area. So everybody got really excited. Why wouldn't we? Till they confirm that by women, they mean men who say they're women. Um, so their signs are very misleading. I went into one Primark earlier this week in the county that I live in and spoke to one of the shop floor staff who basically said, well, if a man wears a dress, he will be allowed in. Um, Primark won't answer how they're going to stop predatory men accessing spaces where women and girls of all ages will be in various states of undress, um, you know, trying their clothes on. They are trusting, and these are their words, they are trusting customers to make the right, you know, to choose the right changing room. So, you know, I think certainly from the women that I'm speaking to, it doesn't feel good enough. Primark have known for a long time um, that this is an issue. Our legislation, the Equality Act 2010, absolutely allows for single sex spaces, um, but they are digging their heels in, in terms of reinstating them. These are just the changing rooms that I've been in. So this is Cardiff last Saturday. I was at Philia um, doing a little bit of research in my lunchtime. You know, you could quite easily film something there. The curtain isn't secure. It's really flimsy. Again, relatively close to me. Um, same curtain arrangements, but you can still film under, um, you know, you could still film somebody under that uh, changing cubicle. This is possibly where um, we're going to try and use some levers. So Primark are owned by a company called Associated British Foods. They're an international conglomerate. They're not on Twitter. Um, their ultimate shareholder are a family called the Westons, who are a very wealthy family and run a very respectable charitable institution in England. They are listed on the stock exchange. Um, I'm now a shareholder, albeit a very modest shareholder. Primark also have about 400 stores in 14 countries that I've listed here. Um, they have a lot of stores in particularly in Spain, um, but they are certainly wanting to um, expand in terms of the locations and the stores that they've got in the UK and geographically. So being in, in these locations was where um, WDI very kindly agreed to support and partner with me in terms of this campaign. So I guess what do we want to do about it? I mean, I'm tweeting every day about it. I'm now bothering them on Facebook. I have written to them numerous times and um, I have had some responses and there is a conversation going on. I don't know where it will get us to, but but we will see. But what we are thinking about doing, we would like to gather information about what Primark are doing in other countries. I am aware there have been issues in, in Spain. I spoke to um, Amparo on Sunday at Filia. We would like to understand what the changing rooms are like. 
Um, what are women's experiences of shopping and changing in Primark? Um, how does it feel um, to shop um, in a place where you know there might be a guy um, changing next door to you who might be there for nefarious purposes? Um, in the UK, um, we are thinking about taking some action on the 3rd of December. It's the weekend before their um, AGM so that we can continue to raise awareness of what's going on in their changing rooms and how dangerous they are. And Standing for Women are um, partnering, possibly thinking about doing something to coincide with their AGM. So it would be um, brilliant to hear from any, well, women in all of the countries that Primark operate in to understand what your experiences are. Great to get some pictures to see what's happening in those changing rooms. Um, I mean, I get we're fighting on all sorts of fronts at the moment and Primark are by no means the only retailer that we want to go for and we want to change. I think it's just so happened that the TikTok film, um, I think it just pressed a nerve, particularly in England. Um, so that's kind of why we've gone for them. But um, I suppose our thinking is if we can get one to change, then we might have more luck with others. And there always has to be a first. But huge thanks to WDI, to Joe um, and Bernadette for being so supportive. It's been very much appreciated. We are now going to go to our final uh, contribution, which is, uh, Zan, would you be able to tell us about what it is? Uh, thank you so much, because Zan put this video clips together. And, yeah. then, and then Bernadette will play it. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, I was at the LA um, Let Women Speak USA, and I'm a volunteer at WDI. WDI. So we decided to put some sort of updates together. This, though, it's only from LA and San Francisco. Um, and it's really intended for those of you who are not really following. Um, I saw in the chat already that there's lots of people that are following. So um, this might not be so interesting. I'm going to put in the link in the chat, though, today and tomorrow, there are two um, events in Austin and Chicago. I'll put that information up there. And this is just some clips from Los Angeles and San Francisco. Face an existential crisis uh, and the bodies of our children through the threat of transgender ideology, we thought we'd come to the very heart of where it's being sold uh, to Americans. Through your schools, your children are being gaslit, coerced and manipulated through your doctors, through your very, very well-funded pharmaceutical industries. Thank you very much for wearing a jumpsuit. Oh yes, this is the... This is what turfs need to be wearing, a jumpsuit. Okay, so I am Melissa Cohen. I'm a turf from Los Angeles. I'm also a turf. Um, this is, a turf is a trans exclusionary regular person. So um, I don't exclude individuals, I exclude an ideology. So I wrote this for Speaker's Corner by proxy last January, but strangely enough, it still applies. Okay. Greetings from Hollywood, California, home of the Wee Spa incident, the Netflix counter protests, and the Ford Children's Hospital LA protests of 2021. Um, I'm looking forward to the day when we have these all over and we don't have to wait for Kelly J to come here and, and goose us into doing this. And I'd like to say that ground zero is no child is born in the wrong body. No child is born in the wrong body. It's an impossibility. And it's, it's just a horrible that even this thought comes up and I know you and I would probably be if we were younger 
we would be the first ones being put on, and I like to think my parents had enough stamina to not put up with the bollocks, but I don't know that they would. I told her I could not honor that because as a science teacher, I had an obligation to speak the truth. Not just to her, not just to her, but to the rest of the class as well. And uh, you know what, she took it really well and we got along great, but at the end of the year, I heard Kelly's voice in my ear saying, if not you, then who, if not now, then when? And I thought to myself, well, I guess I'm the only one going to have a little heart to heart with her. And so I did. I pulled her aside and I had a heart to heart with her and I said um, very lovingly, as, a, as, a, as an older woman is supposed to with young girls, we're supposed to help them through that hard time. And I said, you know, your body is beautiful and it's healthy and there's nothing wrong with it. This is Yvette. I'm here from New Mexico. Flew in this morning. And I have a beautiful little 10-year-old grandson who's autistic, developmentally delayed, he has cognitive delays, and he thinks he's a girl because he likes girls' clothing. And he didn't get this from school. He got this from home. And his sister and his parents love him so dearly and fiercely defend that he's a girl because he says he is. Uh, they made it clear anyone who does not affirm his girlhood will, you know, just leave us alone and come back later. Uh, and you'll teach it like that, okay? Hi, uh, my name is Gigi LaRue, and I'm here as a parent, and I'm also here representing our duty. We staged a... We staged a very successful rally at the American Academy of Pediatrics last weekend. We had 3,000 bags of materials that we handed out to pediatricians who would talk to us. We had people thanking us for keeping this conversation alive. I'm sorry I'm wearing a mask, but I have to stay anonymous because I have a kid in this. And she's probably a lesbian, and I want her to grow up intact. I'm a father of a student athlete, a daughter, in one of the affluent beach cities. And as many of you know, this stuff is absolutely siloed in those kind of communities. They are all in on, on gender ideology. Uh, recently, last few weeks, this sign went up at the entrance to the girls, air quotes, girls locker room. If you identify as a female, please use this locker room. Kids identify as a female. I kind of want to unpack what they're saying, what the school, what the school board is saying to the girls. Well, first of all, they're saying this is no longer a female space. This is not a single sex space. This is a mixed sex space. And they're telling the girls. You now have a job. This is not a job your mother had, because she had the right to a single sex space. It's not a job that your grandmother had. It's not a job that was assigned to the adult women who run the schools. Hi, um, I think this is really, really important. Uh, I was transitioning to female. Um, I had encountered a lot of bullying, and I sort of ran into a situation where I was uh, confronted with uh, situations that, as far as the men, like the male role models I had had, uh, I was like required to fight, essentially. You know, like, you know, say some of these fighting words or something. You know, I was getting bullied a lot, and I was confronted with this feeling that I couldn't be like a man if I wasn't going to like fight these people for saying or doing things to me. Um, who's gonna just remain anonymous? Um, she's actually in prison right now. So, Franny, ready? ready. Okay, let's see if something? Hello? Yeah, hi. Yeah. You guys hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Okay, so first, I want to say thank you to everybody for their input and everything that they're doing for, uh, our, for the movement. Thank you, Amy, for your voice and always standing up for us uh, behind bars. It's been it's been tough feeling like I haven't had a voice for so long, so knowing that you're using your voice is very important to me. It also encourages me and gives me the courage to stand up and speak out. Uh, my story, uh, so my story started when, obviously, when I was a little girl, I was sexually abused and sexually molested from age two to nine. I ended up becoming sex trafficked. Anybody now joining on a stream that's actually working? We're here at uh, Scott Wiener's pumpkin grooming uh, carving session. Um, there's police protecting men wearing women face dressed as witches. 
Um, and there are the actual witches uh, who have to be on the public street because Scott Wiener's team, who don't like turfs, we've been told, I hope that's on my Twitter. Um, Scott Wiener's team, who don't like turfs, uh, said that the park that they've rented, uh, I don't know who for, but apparently we don't count as people that are allowed to be in the park. Um, so I don't know whether they've got a permit that excludes vaginas um, or people that don't go along with grooming kids, but whatever is on that permit means we can't be inside the park. The grown-ups are here. The real grown-ups are here. Yeah. I'm a registered Democrat in California, and I'm a mother. I've been asked many times, why do I care about children transitioning? My answer is this, why don't you care? Yeah. Why don't you care? Yes. Yeah. Children are being experimented on. Children that are experiencing gender dysphoria are currently not getting appropriate mental health services. Instead, professionals are affirming their delusion and sending them down a path of sterilization and lifelong medicalization by prescribing puberty blockers, off-label, cross-sex hormones, and irreversible surgeries. During an already emotionally confusing time, puberty. The cure for puberty, for this confusion, is to experience puberty. My name is Renee Marcel, and I am a turf. Uh, a year ago, I didn't know what a turf was. When I found out what a turf was, it made me very, very sad that there had to be such a thing. I have been a feminist since 1975. I used to teach women's studies at the University of Washington. Oh, wow. Wow. And I was so proud of it. And you know, what stood true then continues to stand true to this day. And that is that our language has been taken away from us. The first day of class in the women's studies class at the University of Washington, I had all of the women announce, well, what are all of the negative terms that you can describe a woman with? And what are all of the negative terms used to describe a male? We came up with over a hundred for women. And I thought there would be some kind of evaluation process to go through to get my testosterone and start my transition. Instead, I was prescribed within 30 minutes. Um, this was during COVID. I was prescribed over the phone and I was able to pick up my prescription the same day. Um, they obviously did not look into my medical history. They did not see any of my comorbid mental health conditions. Or if they did, they didn't care. So when I told Senator Wiener this, um, he told me this wasn't happening. Um, gaslit me, as well as the other detransitioners who can corroborate my story. So this is the kind of culture in the United States that we're dealing with with children. So I can't even imagine being 13, reading this stuff online, and then being affirmed by my teachers, my doctors, president of the United States. About the cancer risk. The Netherlands, that back in 2019, they've known about this for a while, they did a nationwide cohort, looked at 2,200 trans women who were put on estrogen, and they found that it increased the rate of breast cancer by 46 times. That's not 426 times, 46 times. So that is an enormous, that's not a subtle effect at all. And it's going to be shocking come midterm elections. Shocking. I have a question for all of you. How many of you have the same exact feelings you had when you were an adolescent? Anybody? Anybody feel exactly the same they did? Did you, did you like, have anything that you thought was going to be, you know, lifelong decisions that you could make as a 12 year old, 10 year old? Anybody? No. No. So, this feeling that these children have that they are in the wrong body is a feeling and it will change. For already four years in therapy and on antidepressants, I finally asked one of my mothers if I could go to the doctor to seek help for gender dysphoria. She agreed to schedule an appointment as she knew I had been struggling with conforming and like many parents would have done absolutely anything to help her depress and suicidal son. I remember the excitement and nervousness I felt as the appointment date approached. As we got closer to the date, my mom asked me if I was sure I wanted to go to the doctor for this. She tried her best to explain my, to my naive and malleable teenage brain that seeking this care was something I should not feel any uncertainty about. While in today's world, this questioning from my mother would be seen as deeply transphobic, I'm immensely grateful that I had a trusting enough relationship with her. Sorry, and Frank, uh, she died because of Nazi ideology. 
and there are a lot of uh, children dying because of trans ideology. I do connect the two. And I also want to say that um, I was trans for a year after dating a, a guy who uh, uh, claimed to be five and he was actually gay. So I was convinced that I was a gay guy. And I got a hold of the, uh, the Leatherman's Guide, published in 1969. And it, uh, at the end, described the ultimate thrill of surgically removing a man's testicles and showing them to him. Take me down memory lane a little bit, although you're not the ones that have the memories I do. This park is something that in 1985 I used to come to with a group of guys, a group of women, a group of lesbians. We used to hang out in this park. We also hung out in Dolores Park, which is another section of the city here. Are there any San Francisco lesbians around my age? I'm in my late 60s at this point. I have been fighting this trans cult for over 40 years. Thank you. Yeah. That doesn't give me some kind of credibility, then yeah. I beg of you to start doing the deep dive because this is ground zero. Yeah. They yeah. came after lesbians first. When I say they, this is a decades long campaign for anybody that says, I don't know why this is going on. You should know by now. If you've never heard of Jennifer Billick, in the 11th hour block, yeah. her motto is, it's capitalism, stupid. Uh huh. That is exactly what's happening. UCSF, which is very close to here, that's who started cutting off the breasts of my brethren. I watched my lesbian community start going down the toilet when I was in San Diego in the 70s, and Olivia Records hired a man to be their recording engineer. After they promised the entire community and they only put out two albums, they were supposed to be helping women understand the recording industry. And, uh, right, so we came here to... <laughs> we came here to San Francisco because uh, SB 132 puts male rapists in women's prisons. Mr. Wiener staff, that means I'm a bad person for not wanting women to be raped in prison. Uh, he also has made this a sanctuary state, which means you can come all across the country to get your child sterilized or your daughter's breast removed. I mean, it's wholesome, it's not like pumpkin carving. Um, so he has this pumpkin carving with uh, sexualized caricature parodies of women called drag queens. Um, wearing women face and lots of people here are quite happy to endorse a man who basically promotes the sterilization of children and the reason I don't think they're bad people I think they just believe the lie that puberty blockers are reversible I think they believe the lie that being born in the wrong body is actually a thing you are your body you cannot be born in the wrong body, you are your body. We tell people all the time to love the body they're in.